So I discovered a list of the top seven things you will never hear in church. Number seven, it's my turn to sit in the front pew. Number six, I was so memorized, I never noticed that you preached for an hour. That will be funny by the end of the service. Personally, I find witnessing door-to-door much more enjoyable than golf. Number four, I volunteer to be the permanent teacher for the sixth grade Sunday school class. Number three, I love it when we sing songs I've never heard before. Number two, Reverend, we'd like to send you to a conference in Barcelona. No, number one, top ten things you'll never hear. Number one, nothing inspires me and strengthens my commitment like our annual stewardship campaign. So I'm hoping that you'll be inspired this morning because it's that time of the year again. We begin our stewardship focus this morning. Can I get an amen? How about an inspiring amen? Yeah, our stewardship theme is inspiring generosity, and the logo is is printed in our bulletin. Just take a quick look with, at it for me. The hands and the hearts, they symbolize the giving of our time, talents, and treasure to living Christ-like lives here doing ministry and mission at Pine Shores. The trunk, the tree trunk, depicts a person with their arms up in praise of God and their arms open to welcome all. The trunk also represents the baptismal font, reminding us that we belong to God and each of us is called and claimed and cleansed by Christ, which is represented by the head. So this inspiring generosity is an important message for us to hear because we know that the more generous with who we are as people, with what we have, the richer our lives become. And that is true. And yet... It doesn't feel like being generous is all that wise these days. The um, Hong Sing Index, the Shanghai Composite, are unpredictable and scary, resulting in all the major financial index experiencing Mr. Toad's wild ride. And I am not, I'm sure that I don't know one person who is not jittery and anxious about the financial volatility of the markets, and yet, here we are talking about stewardship. Now, the practical side of me says to soft-pedal stewardship this year. The timing is all wrong. Keep it cute and clever. Talk around the issue. Don't Jim Cramer it up. Anxious folks are not good givers, are they? So after 33 years of practice, I can do that. I can soft-pedal stewardship. I can sound kind of smart and say nothing. And you will hear nothing, but I will sound smart, and all will be well with our souls. But something deeper appeared. Other questions arose. Why am I allowing the volatility of the Shanghai composite to scare me when it comes to living Christ-like lives? when it comes to my giving of time and talent to what's most important? Has my financial investments become the most important investment of my life? Is that where my security comes from? And what are the other negative indicators that impact my trusting in God's promise? And the deepest question, how afraid am I to trust God more completely? If stewardship is really a way of living that involves one's daily activities, values, and goals for life and the use of all of our possessions, and if I'm a steward responsible to manage God's gifts to me, God's gifts among us, I know. I know I can do better. I know I can be less afraid. And I know I can trust God more to become a better at it. I just don't know if I want to. And that is startling. So I read an abstract. It was entitled, Exegetical Concept of Biblical Stewardship. 
as compared to postmodern thinking and current trends. It was tedious and boring. All that science and methodological stuff. Karen is correct when she says that I need a life. But I, just so you know, I read it for you, each one of you. And apparently the study was motivated by the observation of a systemic continual progression of lack of stewardship in the form of giving of time, talent, and treasure in American churches and a decreasing sense of spiritual maturity as demonstrated by a lack of involvement and interest in deeper spiritual matters. You know what the findings proved? Beyond, Libby, by, a way, by the way, beyond statistical significance, the study proved that the growth of faith produces a firm desire to be faithful in our stewardship. Another way to state it is growth in faith determines growth in stewardship. Now, I've always said that stewardship, the giving of our time and talent and treasures, is a spiritual matter, not a math problem, and now I can prove it, statistically and significantly prove it. So in the New Testament, there's two Greek words that embody the meaning of our English word stewardship. The first word is epothroos, and then the second word is oikonomos, and the words both mean steward, manager, or administrator. And so the word stewardship simply means to manage someone else's property. And Scripture teaches us that everything belonged to God. We manage God's property and property. Basically, our attitude and view from a biblical perspective is that our things are really God's things and our stuff is really God's stuff and all that we could have and all that we have lost and all that we will have is God's. So from a scriptural understanding, we are more like occupants of the property, holders of the money or the, the relationships or the talents and the time. So our responsibility then is to, to learn how to become more faithful stewards, managers of the resources entrusted to us in our care. We are asked to become the best managers of the abilities that we have. So here's the problem. The biblical understanding of stewardship runs contrary to our economic system. Capitalism is what makes the world go round. It lets me enjoy evenings out with my lovely wife and drive a granddaddy's Buick. Capitalism is the system in which investments in and ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange of wealth is made and maintained chiefly by private individuals or corporations. So there's this constant tension. We are people of faith, and we live as a people of capitalism. It's always present, always causing friction, challenging us to find a place to coexist. We live with the Shema, as well as the Shanghai Composite, both influencing our lives. So here, I'm not really so sure that there's any satisfactory resolution. I could make something up, but you'd figure it out you figured I was faking it. But as people of faith, I'm also not willing to declare us as hypocrites, merely selling out and compromising our integrity and beliefs for gain or security. We live with this tension that simply is the way it is for us. So now the question is we have a choice on how to live in this tension. We don't have to be controlled by the negative effects of the economics, we can journey differently. We can learn how to be a little better stewards. In the economic system of Jesus' day, think about this. He preached abundance. He preached about mustard seeds and pearls of great price and demonstrated how just a few little table scraps could feed 5,000 people. Jesus pointed people to a more abundant reality rather than the scarce circumstances that surrounded them. 
But that direction requires something of us. It requires faith to see and faith to embody. It, and that place of faith leads to hope. And hope can always lead us in a new direction. It has been said that we need to think our way into a new way of manner of living. And so what I would suggest from a faith perspective, we live into a new way of thinking. And I am convinced that there is a path, a more excellent way to journey, and we are invited to live it, to live a more generous life. I found in the study that generous and generate come from the same Latin word. Generous means giving, generate means multiply. Same word. Consequently, generosity multiplies giving. And God's desire for us is to multiply our gifts by giving to each other. God's desire for us is to be more affectionate to each other. Because that will multiply it. I have a colleague who told me about one of her friends and the friend's discipline is that whenever she feels the strain of scarcity and fear, that she gives something away. She gives some money away. She gives some time away. She gives some of her gifts away. She becomes simply more generous. And the more fear she feels, the more she gives. And she says this, it may not move mountains or solve hunger or solve my economic problems, but it always points me back to the direction of God's life-giving abundance. It always leads me away from culture's message of fear. Countering fear with generosity is worth considering. Our passage this morning talks about our gifts, Various kinds of gifts, it reads, but of the same spirit, charis matan, from the word charisma. And the word charisma is related to the words charos. And charos means grace. And yet, it's interesting that in the Greek culture of that day, in Corinth was a Greek city, charos also meant to support. The word keros can mean generosity. So what I'm going to suggest to you is that we were designed to be generous with our gifts. So sometime today, either in your own reflection between or after football or between or after golf or between after meals, either individually or with your, your, your partner, spouse, children, grandchildren, ask them the same question. What do you see my gift is? And are you being generous with the gift that you have? I think God designed us to be generous. I mean, it's not really hard to love someone. Not hard to share the gift of forgiveness and affection and care. It's not that hard. We just have to choose to be generous. So I have a few steps that I want to, to offer you as a way in which you can become more generous. And I know some of them are simple, but, you know, first we need to trust God a little more. And I know that is really simple sounding to trust God just a little bit more, but you know, we have to start believing that God is trustworthy. God has to count more than what's in our bank. And I know that's a bit scary, but God will always make a way for us to be more generous. Think about that. God enables us to be more generous with other people regardless of our current circumstances. Second, we need to think about gratitude and embrace gratitude. If we change our lens 
by thinking about what we have or who is in your life and what they bring to it rather than what we don't have. If we literally count our blessings and name them one by one, we'll embrace gratitude. Third, which is maybe just the hardest of them all, just start. Just start giving. Make a decision to become more generous and follow through. Make a decision to give 30 more minutes a day to a cause that you are committed to. Make a decision to, to, to be patient with somebody for a little bit longer. Make a, a commitment to start to encourage through mentoring a small school child at one of our elementary schools. And see, what it does is that little, that little just starting builds momentum in your life. Fourth, if you want to become more generous, spend a few moments with someone in need. Make space for them. Because you know what? It doesn't take much to go from knowing someone in need to helping someone in need. Fifth, gather yourself around generous people. If you hang around good stewards, if you hang around generous people, it will be a positive influence in your life. I mean, my parents always told me the crowd I hung out with mattered. And if I hung out with the bad crowd, I was going to be considered one of them. And so what if we did the opposite? And what if we said, why don't we gather around generous people? And what does that do to us? And fifth, the sixth one is to find your passion. Find it here. Find it here at church. Find it in the community. Find it in your schools. Find it in your work. But find your passion and ask God to give you the desire to use your gifts. Ask God to help you reach out to other people using your time and your talents. Ask God to help you be open and expectant that God wants to use you along the way. Because, see, God designed us to be generous with our gifts. God designed you to be generous with who you are. So, friends, I simply believe that we can become generous people. We can become better stewards. We can be inspiring Our generosity today can be inspiring. So, let me invite you to be bold. Just be bold and start. Give something of your time. Give something of your talent. And give something of your treasures because we have good news to share. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen.